Oh. Well, don't drop that, man. Relax, it's not a SIG 320. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I wanted to start out talking about a quick recap of some of the gear I took on the recent Golden Gate Frogman swim that I just participated in. If you guys are following us along on Facebook and following along with us on Facebook and the Hook and Loop Society and some of the other things that we have existing social media wise, you've probably seen that we were trying to raise funds for the Navy SEAL Foundation for Nick and I to go swim out in San Francisco for the Golden Gate Frogman Swim. This is their inaugural event and all the funds raised go directly to the Navy SEAL, uh, yes, Navy SEAL Foundation. So it's not like we were raising funds for us to be able to pay to go. We went on our own dimes to go do that event. So also it's, it's a unique event. So it started out I think five years ago in Tampa Bay, Florida and they started doing the Tampa Bay Frogman Swim and we've been a supporter uh, as well as a sponsor at the Tampa Bay Frogman swim for the past couple of years now. We didn't get in right when they started, maybe like two years after or something like that. But it's a great event and everybody donates their time there. So it's a, it's a pretty unique event in that nobody makes money to do the event. So everything that's put together is done purely out of everybody's time that they donate. So all the organizers of the event, nobody's paid. Everyone's just getting together and raising money for the Navy SEAL Foundation just putting on this swim. So it's a really cool event. This was their first year trying to do a second event out in uh, San Francisco. And I really liked that idea. Um, I tried to make a Fro Tampa Bay Frogman swim two years ago and I got all the way out there, flew out there right after SHOT Show with all my gear. You might have remembered a gear tasting video where I had all my scuba stuff with me for some reason in Las Vegas and that was why I say scuba stuff but swim stuff with me in Las Vegas and I was about to fly right out of there to Tampa Bay which I did. The swim got kanked right at the last minute because a huge storm surge blew in, flooded the beach and all kinds of stuff where they were going to do the event so they kanked that. So I was really lucky to be able to get out there for this event in San Francisco and I'm glad I did. So Nick and I uh, swam combat side stroke with fins and mask. Uh, right under the Golden Gate Bridge. It was super cool. Um, the fog had lifted, so we got, we got a really cool view of the, the Bay, or San Francisco Bay Bridge while we were swimming under it. And it was a mile and a half swim. And what I wanted to talk about today is some of the gear that was used for it. So um, if, you've, if you're familiar with combat side stroke, it's basically just a, a different version of side stroke. So side stroke is normally just kind of a stroke like this, but um, the combat side stroke is more of a recovery stroke, so it's used not for speed, but for the ability to traverse long distances without getting tired. So it's not going to compete with a crawl stroke, which most people were doing out there at the event. Um, it's, I mean, yes, you're faster because you have fins on, but like just to give you an idea, my, you know, 50 yard lap time in a pool is right around like a minute, minute, two or three seconds, somewhere in there. Um, and with fins doing the CSS, I'm like 58 seconds. So, and I'm not a super fast crawl stroke person to begin with. So you can see that it's really not that big of a difference in terms of, of speed. So I'm not like putting on fins and getting this huge speed increase. So um, we came in, I think there were, and what's cool is it was a very small group and not that I like that. I wish there were more people there so that they could raise more money for the Navy SEAL Foundation but there were only 14 people swimming, so it was a very small group. There were at least as many, if not double that, out there in support roles helping kayak and things like that because you have support kayakers along with that. So Nick and I had uh, our buddy Steve Wilson out there with us kayaking. Um, and he's been to a muster before, so he's kind of local in the area. We thought, what a better way to, than to get Steve involved in kayak for us. So it was pretty cool until the point when I actually tumped him over in the kayak by accident. So. Um, anyway, I'll put that in the AAR, but I kind of like moved him out of the way at one point and then a rogue wave hit him and yeah, <laughs> he said, I hate you. <laughs> but um, so during that, I was using UDT duck feet. That's my fin of choice for surface swimming. So in surface swimming, I don't like a vented fin. So fins that have vents in them that allow the water to flow through them, in my opinion, aren't well suited for surface swimming, which is what we are doing. Um, those are more suited for diving operations where you want as much power behind your kick as you can. Uh, with venting as, as a surface swimmer, you're actually decreasing the, the power, and I'm kind of contradicting myself and I'll explain. So you're kind of 
taking that power away with venting. Um, under the surface, you, you want the water to flow across the fin because you're completely submerged, whereas surface fin, you're closer to the top of the water, you're, you're not getting as much power behind each stroke, so you want to maximize that as much as possible. Hopefully that makes sense. Apologize if it doesn't. But those are the fins I used. And then um, we were wearing a bunch of neoprene. So the water temperature was between 58 and 60. We never got a real approximate temperature on the water. I didn't bring a thermometer with me, unfortunately. Uh, but it was pretty chilly in the water and I was thankful for all the neoprene I had. So I wore a full suit, which is this Excel suit I have. So it's like a, it's probably like a 3-2. I'd imagine it doesn't have a rating on here, but it feels like a kind of a two in the arms, three in the chest, and then three in the legs. So um, it, it worked really well for me on the swim. It kept me super nice and toasty warm. Um, I did bring along this seven mil suit that I had considered wearing and Nick was going to wear this and it didn't work out and I'm so glad neither of us wore this because we would have completely burned up. Um, we would have been super hot. Nick actually wound up having to take off his hood but I wore mine. So this is an Excel hood that I have that I've worn for a long time and it worked really well for me on the swim. Um, I also wore gloves which that was Nick's suggestion. I'm actually glad that I brought gloves so I had these little Excel titanium gloves that I wore um, they're, they're fairly thin, they're like a 3-2 as well, um, and it does actually say that on here, 3-2. So some areas are a 3, some areas are a 2, and with the CSS, you're really not deriving a whole lot of power from your hand movement, so it's not as integral to, you know, make sure you're getting... I always cut my hands anyway, that's a, that's a thing that I learned early on in swimming. You know, if you, if you spread your fingers out when you're swimming, you're not you're decreasing the surface area so you're not getting as much pull so you always want to kind of cup your hands like that but the gloves didn't interfere with that at all I thought it was really good um, and I like these kind of sock neoprene socks when I when I dive or when I um, use UDT duck feet when I use regular fins I'll use a full-on booty but um, I like these little neoprene socks they're fairly thin uh, the only downside to them is they kind of catch water, so whenever you get out of the water you look like you have balloon feet because all this water is just hanging out in the, in the booty. So there can be a little bit of decreased momentum because of the water that fills up in these, but I still feel like it's the best bet for these uh, duck feet. So I wear like a super, that's the size on these duck feet, and I don't have huge feet, but the reason I do that is because it allows the, the fin to kind of move around on my feet more because these are notorious for kind of right where your foot comes across right here. So like the top arch of your foot, you get kind of cramping and it can really be a pain in the butt um, as you wear those fins, especially with regular booties too. So that, this was my combo whenever I swam that all the time at Buds and I've just kind of stuck with this for a long time. So this has worked out well for me, so I wanted to kind of provide that feedback. Um, then mask wise, so Nick had a mask, I had a mask. Um, I use this US, this Aqualung mask. This is the one that I've really been a fan of for a long time. Um, it's probably, in my opinion, the best mask on the market. Also comes in awesome black color. Um, that's a big thing for me, obviously. Um, Got to be tactical. The, uh, this is a good mask. I also brought a pair of goggles that I swim with when I do laps too, just as a backup. Um, and I had these in my... Um, carry-on bag versus check bag with those just in case something happened to my bag at least I could still make the swim happen um, so I was a little nervous about airport losing my bag which I usually am I just hate checking a bag um, and then I also I didn't bring it I let, decided to leave it at home but this helio pressure shower really would have come in handy um, luckily there was a hose there to rinse off all the gear if you're operating in kind of a saltwater environment you always want to rinse everything um, and this pressure shower from Nemo is awesome for that. It could have filled it up with fresh water, but then again, I would have had to have fresh water to fill it from, so um, it was good to have a hose to be able to rinse my gear. So we had originally planned to carry dive knives and uh, some kind of uh, inflation, like safety inflation, just in case. Um, and these cold steel SRKs are the knives that um, I favor for a dive knife. It's the one uh, that we used at Buds. I'm very familiar with it. I know how to sharpen it really well. So it kind of checks all those boxes. Um, and it mounts to a belt really nicely as well. And we were going to use these dive belts. Um, and then I have these little 
we call them kidney beans or these little inflation devices. So basically you pull this handle and it inflates kind of a, a large bladder, which let me open this up. So it's got an actuator on it right here. So when you pull it, it, it releases the CO2 cartridge in the actuator. And this fills up in a big bladder. So you can see how the shape is, like that looks like a kidney bean. And it tucks under your arm on each side. So you have two of them so that when you inflate them in an emergency, you pull down on the handles and then you kind of use this as flotation. Um, Honestly, we decided to go without those just because I didn't want to jack with bringing the CO2 cartridges on the airplane. I started reading about that. I really wasn't sure how that would go, so I decided to leave these at home. Luckily, the salt water was super buoyant in San Francisco Bay, and it really wasn't an issue. We were pretty buoyant, and even for, for went the, the dive knives. We did watch shark videos right before we went swimming, but we didn't see any dorsal fins. So that's kind of an overview of the equipment. Um, one last thing that I want to say is it's always good to have spares. That's something I learned a long time ago in the Navy. So we had a spare dive mask and a spare pair of fins on the kayak just in case one of us lost a fin or lost a mask. That way we could continue to swim. So it's always good to have those kind of contingencies set up when you're doing any kind of event, especially this. All right, guys. So next I want to talk about the Radian Model 1 again. So if you remember from a couple of videos ago that we did last month, uh, we kind of went over the specs and features of the Radian Model 1, and now I'm proud to say that I've been to the range with it a couple times. We've shot it. I've got about 120 rounds through it, and I'd like to kind of show you some of that footage that we'll show in a second, as well as kind of talk through some of the things and my perception thus far using the system, especially the ADAC, which is the ambidextrous dual action control. So, uh, first off, I want to just go through a couple of things we did at the range to start with. So. Um, as you'll notice, there's a suppressor on the end of this. This is a Silencer Co. Saker, um, and I wanted to make sure all of our zeroing was done with the MRO, the Trigicon MRO, with the suppressor on there, because you can get a POI shift or point of impact shift um, when you're running suppress versus non-suppress, so I wanted to make sure, because I'm running a suppressor, that we use that when we're doing the zeroing process. So, I don't know if I've ever really talked about kind of how I like the zero or anything like that. Uh, I went with a 50 yard zero just because of the relative nature of how successive distances fall on the human body as you get out to different ranges. We've talked about that kind of ad nauseum before in a video and I will link to that episode of Gear Taster where we talked about the different uh, bullet drops um, at different ranges versus the kind of zero that you start with. So we'll make sure we link to that. So. I wanted to really experiment with the MRO because the MRO was sent by Radian because they've developed this uh, proprietary mount for the MRO, which I wanted to test out too. So we really got a chance to kind of see how that handled itself, as well as this is the first time I've ever used an MRO. So I've always been an aimpoint guy. I've used the T1 and now a T2. So I've always just defaulted to those because they've really worked for me. And I do have a little feedback about the MRO and how it performs. So, what I really found handy out there was the Multitasker Twist. I'm a big fan of the products that Shane over at Multitasker makes, and the Twist is no exception. Uh, it makes a really handy range tool. So this little, those two knobs on the top of the Multitasker Twist are actually for the two uh, indentations on a aim point. So this is also great for the MRO too because I was able to take this off and use that kind of flathead screwdriver option on the pocket clip to adjust the MRO. It came in really handy for that. So that's what I used. It's kind of my go-to at the range for that. Um, and so what we did is we put up an IPSC target at 50. You know, obviously I didn't make any changes on the gun. I just put the suppressor on. We went and shot a volley of five rounds. I walked down range and checked out where they fell before I made any adjustment. And that's obviously what I'd recommend in any situation. Depending on the range you're at, you always want to you know, take a couple rounds first and, and see where that's at. Um, you may have to do more adjusting that way, but it's better than just kind of Kentucky windaging it and just kind of trying to figure out some initial adjustments before you even shoot it. Um, I like carrying this kind of tape that matches the Ipsic Target cardboard. So I bought a huge pack of these a long time ago and a couple rolls of tape and I still haven't run through it. It's, it's been quite a while. But I like using tape to mark the, the holes that I've already marked or basically seen on the target already. So as the adjustments go, 
um, I just go down there and mark with tape and it makes it easy um, rather than kind of putting tick marks and then hoping that I re don't you know remember because sometimes bullets do go in the same holes and things like that so the tape is kind of my my way to better remember that um, this is kind of the thing I always bring to the range too so I've always got a staple gun that's kind of the staple if you will at the range um, anytime I'm there but then I also take a bunch of these huge binder clips and I have these target frames that I have that take some little spars of wood and then I basically put the ipstick target on those two spars and on the mounting system and then I clip those to the to the wood spars so these make a pretty handy quick way to uh, to do that unless you happen to have buddies that shoot the binder clips. <laughs> so <laughs> Rob's shaking his head. I don't know if it was you or not, but I got a hole in one of my target stands too. But anyway, who did that will remain nameless. It wasn't Rob, I promise. But just a couple of tips that I wanted to toss out about zeroing and range accessories and things like that. And then I also always take this to measure distance. I am super anal retentive, as you guys know, so I like to know exactly what kind of distance I'm shooting at because it matters to me. So, uh, you know, it's easy to know whether it's a 50 or a 100, but if you're out at just some land and you don't really know where you're shooting from, it's always good to have a, you know, a wheel like this to, uh, to actually roll and see what the distance is. So I always usually wind up taking that depending on what range I'm going to as well. Kind of a, a range staple. So next, I just want to walk through some of the different manipulations and drills that I kind of did to test out uh, the Radian Model 1 as well as the ADAC system. So let's go to some of those. Okay, so I wanted to clear up a couple of things before I get into kind of my feedback on what I've kind of felt thus far on the Model 1. Um, in the video before, I think I mentioned it was like 6065 aluminum or something. It's 7075 T6 aluminum is what's on the Radian Model 1. Yes, 
I had to check my notes just to be sure. Um, and also I talked about selector switches in the last video too. And I, I kind of put together a combo of two of the longer selector switches and you can do that. I think I said that it comes a certain way. Radian's got lots of options, so the little selector switches, if you want a longer throw on these, uh, you can absolutely do that, so definitely check that out. So, first off, MRO. I'm still an Aimpoint guy. I, you know, I gave the MRO a shot. I kind of liked it. Um, I just don't like the slight parallax that's in it, and yes, I know that most red dots have some type of parallax to them. I just didn't really like the parallax I was seeing personally in the MRO. Um, and also, I didn't like the slight magnification. I think it's like a 1.05 or something like that magnification. Um, and I didn't care for that. I felt like it screwed with my vision when I was bringing the gun up and getting a sight picture. So, um, I'm just not a fan. I mean, that's, that's kind of really all there is to it. I'm just, I'm more of an aim point guy. I've been using them. It's not just because I'm what I'm, what I'm used to. I mean, I know how to kind of look objectively at a new product. I've been doing that for years. So, um, I just didn't care for those two things and that was that's enough for me to want to stick with what I'm used to and because I know I don't get that magnification issue uh, with the Aimpoint T1 and T2. There is a wider field of view though in the MRO and that was one of the upsides of that. So I felt anyway that I was getting a wider field of view. In, in reality it might not be, it might be an optical illusion, I'm not sure, but I did feel like that was happening with the MRO. So. That would be a check in the positive column and the other two would be a check in the negative column. So therefore, negative outweighs the positive, I'll stick with Aimpoint. Anyway, so the ADAC system I really did find to be pretty impressive. Um, when, it when it came to clearing malfunctions, uh, such as the self-induced double feeds that we set up for some of those drills, uh, I did feel like it was super fast compared to a traditional AR system in clearing those malfunctions. Now, I really love the ADAC system. I like what you're able to, um, to do with it. I love that you can lock out the bolt um, in many different ways. I love the ambidextrous nature of that. I love the, the big paddle on the side to slam the bolt home. There's so many good features about that, but it does take some getting used to. So, you know, I will state that as kind of a caveat to the system. It does take work and you do have to learn. Um, because at one point I went to, uh, slam the bolt home and I wound up dropping the mag just because I wasn't used to the system as a whole. As, as time progressed and I got more used to it, that really wasn't an issue, but it does take time. You're not just going roll right, to roll this right out of the box and be super comfortable using the, the ADAC system. So that is a concern of mine uh, when it comes to AR manipulation stuff. It's a, it's a learned trait. It's not something that's going to be inherent like the controls you're already used to on an AR. And I say that to the people out there that have been using an AR a long time. So I'm not saying that to say that you're not going to get used to this. If this is your first AR and that's how you're shooting, hey, you're probably not going to have a problem because you're learning that system as it is the kind of the proprietary controls that Radian has from the get-go. And that can be a better thing sometimes depending on where you fall into that learning process. So if you've already had plenty of AR experience, that might not even, um, that issue might pop up. So um, charging handle, I did find that the suppressed charging handle which has got these little vents on it, which you might be able to see just a little bit of, but we went over those on the last video. I did find that that kept a lot more gas out of my face versus some of the other charging handle options. And we did try one from the, I think I put a PRI gas buster in there and I put a traditional charging handle and I kind of experimented with some different options for charging handles. And I did find that the suppressed version was better, even better than the, the traditional or the normal Radian Raptor charging handle too. So the suppressed version does offer some characteristics, again, if you're shooting suppressed, which I am. So I did find that that was better in terms of the gas blowback on my face. Um, I found that, you know, it was nice having ambidextrous options on everything. You know? So not only with the charging handle being able to charge that from either side, but the left hand manipulations that I did were, were interesting to kind of be a part of too. That's not something I normally do at the range all the time and I'm guilty of that. I need work on that. I should shoot more off-handed stuff and I just, I don't allow myself to do that enough. It does happen once in a while, but not as much as it should and it showed from um, what I was doing at the range when I was messing with the left-handed control. So, um, and it wasn't just because of the ADAC system or anything like that. That was a personal issue with me and I definitely need more left-handed manipulation work. So, um, 
Overall, I'm really impressed with the Radian Model 1. I think it's, uh, it's a great package, especially out of the box. Um, I love the, the options that you can get when you configure this thing from Radian. So I've got nothing but good things to say about it. I mean, I feel like we're, we're living in an interesting age of ARs, you know, where they've become pretty ubiquitous. Anybody can build one at home. But what Radian's offering is something that is not able to be built at home. So if you're looking for kind of the next cutting edge stuff that's coming out in the AR market, this is absolutely some of the, the hot stuff on the market, so to speak. So this ADAC system can be replicated somewhat by like a Magpul bad lever, but you're also dealing with a lot of issues with now you've got something else in the, the trigger guard with the bad lever and things like that. So. I really like what Radian is bringing to the table with these, this upgraded system on the Model 1 with the ADAC, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to spending more time with it. All right, so now the big reveal. Drum roll, I get on my snare and do a drum roll, but I'm not going to. I'll just pretend like I'm doing it. So the big YouTube winner, and Rob's very excited because he found out there's a way to select a winner out of a big bunch of YouTube comments uh, randomly, which is pretty cool. So we thought we were going to have to like number them and yeah, we've had to do that before. But anyway, there's now a, a feature somewhere existing online that does that for you. So just FYI if you have a YouTube channel. All right, so winner is Donny B. The AR series and the video on installing the piece on your door so it can can't be easily kicked in, stand out in my mind. I'm reading this comment, by the way, sorry. I've been watching for several years your channel as well as your website and store are outstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, the super quick shipping with extras from you in Texas to me in New York is impressive. We aim to please. You're welcome, Donnie. Gog bless you in all your future endeavors. I don't know who Gog is, but Gog bless you too. Um, appreciate you watching and appreciate everybody that entered. It was awesome going back and reading through your comments and listening to what you guys found interesting and how long you've been watching our YouTube channel. It's just super cool. Um, I love the growth that we've had. I hope we get another 150 million, no. 50 million, sorry, jumping ahead of myself, 50 million views on our videos uh, in the next couple years, and I hope that our subscriber base continues to grow. So thank you very much for subscribing at home. Uh, we do plan to do more giveaways like this in the future, and can't thank you guys enough for your support. Thanks for watching.